I thought a lot about what the story is, and the technology I'm working on right now is really cool. But there's kind of a thread that I noticed, and the thread is energy. I've worked in solar, in turbines, that's the wind part, in fire, I worked in coal, and now I'm working in water. That's all the energy, but there's also a part of me that's very spiritual, and that's really an energy also. So that is conventional hydro, and you've all seen dams. It is a different kind of renewable because it's 24-7. It's been around for over 150 years. Traditionally, it's damming a river, but there's also a lot of work in putting turbines and irrigation canals. But what I'm doing is really different. What I'm doing is working with water pipes, gravity-fed water pipes where normally you would just burn off the excess pressure, and we're using that instead putting turbines in water pipes. So this is a picture of our turbine. It's very simple. We call it spinning gravity into electricity. Just bolts onto the pipe and the turbine is inside and spins. And what's interesting about this is it has huge media attention. We did a video um, over the Christmas holidays and it got seven million views in one month. And I can't quite figure it out. I've only been the CEO for a year, so this company has been around for a few years before that. But I think the difference is, if you remember what I showed you before with the big turbines, it's hard to understand the big turbines, conventional turbines that have been around for so long. And this is so simple. So when I talk to people about it, they'll say, oh, lucid energy, you're the egg beater in the pipe, right? So, People can understand it, and I think that's, you can visualize it, you can see it, and I think that that's really the beauty of the technology. So this is a video of, that shows you what we're doing and kind of gives you the feeling of how the turbine works. This is our pilot facility in Portland. We have four turbines. We make about a thousand for many megawatt cities hours and a year. Towns around the world, drinking water comes from mountain reservoirs or high elevation storage tanks. Thanks to gravity, as this water flows downhill through pipelines, it builds up pressure, a lot of pressure. Enough pressure to blow the taps off There's our the sinks. There's the faucets. So water agencies remove the excess pressure with valves. We asked a simple question. What if we could harness some of that excess pressure to generate environmentally Those pipes are 42 inches in diameter. Without disrupting water delivery. The vault and underground is about 55 feet. Put a turbine in it. That's how the Lucid Pipe power system was born. Lucid Pipe turbines are installed inside of large diameter, gravity-fed water pipes. As the water flows through, the turbines spin, converting excess pressure into environmentally friendly, renewable energy without disrupting the flow of water. It's hydropower that doesn't harm ecosystems, and it can operate day and night, rain or shine. Water agencies like Riverside Public Utilities and the Portland Water Bureau are already using the Lucid Pipe power system. Riverside, California uses the electricity to run water operations during the day and to power streetlights at night. Electricity produced by the Lucid Pipe power system in Portland is being sold to the local energy utility through a power purchase agreement. The opportunity is huge for this new source of renewable energy. The US EPA says between $650 million and $1 trillion must be invested in water infrastructure over the next 20 years to make it sustainable. As water agencies replace aging pipelines and grow to satisfy new demand, with all that water flowing, 
Imagine how much clean energy we can generate if we put lucid pipe turbines in it. We have a pilot facility in Portland. There's one in Riverside, California too, but this facility is really important because it serves as the test bed to validate the technology. Reliability is a really big issue. It doesn't pencil, the economics don't work unless we can build a turbine that lasts 15 to 20 years. And because hydropower has been around for so long, that kind of reliability is really expected. This is a new technology, so we need to be able to test and show exactly how much energy we can make and we've gained a lot of insights that will let us iterate on the next design. The issue in a new technology is merging cost and performance with a design that is reliable. We've also been able to really understand what the technology differentiators are and understanding what some of the limitations are of this early system. So what's next? We're in the middle of a funding raise. We will be partnering with a turbine manufacturing company to try to tap into their experience to make it more reliable. And we'll iterate the design. This again, this cost and performance um, convergence. And in 2018, we'll be testing our next design and launching our product in 2019. So how did I get here? Um, and this is part of my story that I am the product of a poet and the engineer. And yes, my mother was the poet, my father was the engineer. I think I was born curious, and now I look at this picture, and I think I was born very serious. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of four girls, and I think my father kind of looked around and said, oh, I'm outnumbered, but I was the only one of the four that could add, and he said, you should be an engineer. So. I became an engineer back when girls didn't do that. I think out of 400 mechanical engineers in Illinois, I went to school in Champaign-Urbana, I think there were three women, and I was definitely the only one who wore lipstick. Uh, <laughs> but I kind of didn't notice. The, the story was that the Society of Women Engineers started, I think in the 30s, 1930s. But they had a saying, they said, we don't want you to be a woman engineer, just an engineer. So I got really lucky and I got a scholarship to Stanford and graduated there in 1982. There were a few more women then, but not very many. And then finished my PhD as I was working full time in 1990. And the story there is that I'm a classic overachiever. And I think that I just had to keep pushing myself until there was no more school to go to. So while I was working on my PhD, I got the most amazing job. Sandia National Labs has facilities in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Livermore. And as one of several things I did in that 15 years, I was project manager of a molten salt solar receiver. So that's the sun part of my talk. I wonder what the photographer was thinking in this picture. That's me in the middle. Um, and there were a lot of men. I guess I see that now. One of the other things I did at Sandia was we developed a metal emissions monitor using lasers. And once again, I was the only girl in the group. Towards the end of that 15 years, Sandia decided that it would be a good idea to try to transfer some of the technologies from the national labs into business. And I had already understood that I had a real keen interest in business. I was a PhD engineer, but I really liked the idea of how business and technology can intersect. So this is an article that the San Francisco Chronicle wrote. I was the first technology transfer out of Sandia. So they started talking about this. And I said, me, 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 I want to do it. And so I actually left Sandia to try to commercialize this metal emissions monitor. And there was a lot of good publicity. And six months into my leave of absence from Sandia, I realized it was never going to work because we were ahead of the market. There was no regulation to measure metals and it wasn't going to work. Those are commercially available, by the way, now. That was 25 years ago. So I landed on my feet and I started a company called Sky Plus with a very, very talented business partner. And we had a contract with a jet engine company, that's the wind part of my talk, and we figured out how to put ceramic into 3D printing resin. This is back in 1995, 3D printing was in its infancy. 
And we figured out how to make turbine blade molds and cast those for jet engines. So this is a tray about this big of first stage turbine blades. And what you could do with 3D printing is you could make these very, very intricate designs because these blades in a jet engine actually operate about 200 degrees higher than the melting temperature of the alloy. So the cooling through these blades is very, very important. And we could do designs this way that nobody else could do. Design, that is a theme, right? I did design and build our house back in 2001. This is in the middle of Sky Plus. Those are my kids sitting there. And that was a really good experience for me and something kind of that was in my passion. Just as I sold Sky Plus, I started another company. Literally a week later, a friend of mine, a colleague from when I had worked at Sandia called me and said, I have this idea for clean coal. And I said, I don't know anything about coal, hence the fire in my talk. But I did have a PhD in combustion and we figured out together how to put an additive on coal that allowed the coal to burn cleaner. So these are pictures of coal-fired power plants. And in the right, you see a little additive device that went over the coal and then as it burns, it makes it burn cleaner. The interesting thing was that it took almost four years to make our first sale because power plants aren't in the business of anybody messing with their coal. I mean, they'll put scrubbers on and, and treat things downstream. And I kept saying, I know, but this is simple and it's cheap and it's cost effective. And they said, you're not touching my coal. So it was actually a group in Missouri that took our first offering. And from there, then I think there we have 17 plants running. So it took a long time. And there's actually a similarity between that hurdle in, in making this successful and what I'm doing now. Because water agencies aren't really in the business of making electricity. They're in the business of delivering water. And so the idea of putting a turbine into their water delivery pipe is about the same as saying, I'm gonna put something on your coal. So I, I get this mentality of it being hard. I married again in 2010. And as part of this Clean Coal Solutions, one of the companies that was our partner company went public and we got to ring the NASDAQ bell in 2015. And the kids grew up. So I did all this raising kids. I was single most of that time. The interesting thing is that my daughter is almost six feet tall. <laughs> my son is seven feet tall. <laughs> this is the other part of the energy that I've learned a lot in the 37 years that I've been an engineer. And I'm learning a lot right now. My job right now is really hard because bringing a new technology into such a historical industry and breaking out into water pipes, it's hard. And that no matter what you do, no matter what you're inventing, that the design needs to be collaborative and it needs to be historical. So you need to be able to go back, and this is why partnering with a turbine company is gonna be so important, because I have to tap into that history. I failed a lot, often and hard. But there's no innovation without failure, and I'm comfortable with that now. I also think in getting a PhD, you learn what you don't know, and you get really clear about the difference in what you know and what you don't know with being inquisitive enough to figure out what you don't know, or at least collaborate with the right people. The spiritual part of me believes that courage doesn't just happen. I think that vulnerability is part of that path. And I was thinking, many times that being a barista might be a lot easier than the things I've taken on. So often I wish for an easier job. I try really hard to be still, to find that peace inside of me. I cook a lot and I set long tables of love. This is a poem that I found in a Christmas card in 1975 for my mother. And I thought it was really interesting. It says, if of thy mortal goods thou art bereft, and from thy slender store, two loaves alone to thee are left. Sell one, and with the other dole, buy hyacinth to feed thy soul. And that's what she believed. And part of me, the practical me, would say no. <laughs> that's not practical. But I think that there's something really beautiful about this because it is the practical and the impractical and it's what's maybe inside of all of us is that we're not just one way, we're not just the engineer, the, the businesswoman, that there is something about the beauty 
of life. And this is another part of my quest about happiness. This is a saying from a recent book by Glennon Doyle. And it says, you're not supposed to be happy all the time. Life hurts and it's hard. Not because you're doing it wrong. It hurts for everybody. Don't avoid the pain. And this last one, be still with it. It becomes the fuel you'll burn to get your work done. And that's kind of the energy part of it all together. Thank you.